a lot of questions about the future of this team in today's mailbag edition of the show. What are they going to do in the offseason? What's a realistic expectation for Joey Bart's performance in 2023? So we're going get to get into all of that and much more next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015. And I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, as promised, it is a mailbag edition of the show. These are questions that were asked to me late last week. We got to some of them last week, and there's a lot more left over. So jumping right in. The first question comes from Katie, who says, "Do you? Where do you see the direction of this team next year? More of piecing together a team and waiting for a good core of prospects to develop. And basically the answer I want to give you is that that seems to be the direction of this team until proven otherwise. And so I have gone into the last few off seasons thinking it was going to be different than it was. And so I'm not really going to do that again until they prove otherwise. I don't think we can just sit here and say, yeah, they're going to go after this, that and the other superstar talent. And they're going to get them all, and then they're going to be totally out of the norm for them. I just, they haven't done it yet. They did pursue some guys, and so it's possible they could continue to pursue some guys and perhaps land someone like an Aaron Judge or Trey Turner or whoever. I do think they tend to make moves. They don't just kind of sit back and let a bunch of minor leaguers come and populate their major league team. They fill out a team, and so Carlos Rodon leaves in free agency or becomes a free agent, and I think they need to fill that void, although there's a case to be made. You kind of want to free up a spot for Kyle Harrison, who may arrive next year. So I think they'll make moves. They've always been active, but they haven't been active in the big fish market, and so until they prove otherwise, I would not necessarily expect that, and I do think piecing together a team and waiting for a good core of prospects to develop seems to be the perpetual direction of this team, we're still just waiting for those prospects to develop. So hopefully that happens, because if that's the strategy, then it's not going to be that exciting product that fans want until those really good players come up and make that impact. But there's a case to be made, their farm system hasn't progressed as hoped at all. So more on that later. But next question comes from Joey is Daddy, who says, what's a reasonable prediction for Bart's stats next year. I have a feeling he's going to be an all-star if he plays like he has been for like he has been for an entire season. So I just want to uh, throw a little bit of cold water on the Joey Bart hype train simply because there's still a tendency to swing and miss. There's still a tendency to chase at times. One of the most important and impressive things to me from this season of Joey Bart was actually something he was doing before getting called back up, and that was that there was a dramatic increase in the plate discipline. Because in 2020, when he played 33 games, 111 plate appearances, he was just a wild free swinger, swinging at everything. Pitches in the dirt, pitches in off the plate at his hands, pitches above the zone, just everything. He was hacking and just not good swing decision decisions at all. So this year, even when he was struggling in the beginning part of the year, he was displaying a new level of plate discipline. So clearly something he had worked on very hard. I I suspect he's been using the virtual reality. Win reality, you may see commercials for this product, and they're advertised on billboards or like little advertisements behind home plate a lot during games. But it's like virtual reality, and you can queue up any major league pitcher and practice taking pitches that aren't strikes and like deciding to swing only when they're the right pitches to swing at. So I think he was doing that. That's just a guess. But 
I know that other giants in the past have done this, like Mike Yastrzemski. And anyway, the question is, what's a realistic expectation for next year's stats? I'm not going to go stats like home runs and RBIs. I'm going to go like average on base and slugging. But so for the season this year, Joey Bart is has hit 224 with a 310 on base and 401 slugging. It's actually a 104 weighted runs created plus. He's been better than the league average offensive player by this metric which is an all-encompassing metric, kind of factoring in all the numbers and what your home park is, etc. And that's way above average for catchers. Catchers have a weighted runs created plus of 90 and, you know, a 298 on base. So anyway, I think realistically, even after getting called back up and, and doing better, Bart has hit 284, 324 on base, 490 slugging since getting called back up but still striking out 31.5% of the time over that time period. And for the season, he's at 38.4% strikeout rate. So I think that if you're still living in the land of striking out a little over 30% of the time in kind of a best case scenario, you're going to be limited in some ways. And so I continue to think, like if we look at that line since he was called up, he's it's inflated by a 371 average on balls in play, which I don't think is going to last. He also hasn't walked nearly as much since getting called back up. I'm obviously intrigued. I've talked about it a lot, but I just think realistically, we should probably expect more like a league average batting average, a league average on base. And what that would be this year, the league average for those is a 243 average, a 312 on base. So I think somewhere in there, would be fine for him, but then having above average power. So when I talk about above average power, I really kind of mean the isolated power is going to be above league average. League average is 152. This is slugging percentage minus batting average. And for Bart this year, it's 177. So I think he could possibly maintain that or improve upon that. This is a number that is uh, 2... 206 since getting called back up so if he can have that 206 isolated power to pair with the 243 average and 312 on base you add 200 points to the average there and you've got like a 445 slugging so 243 average 312 on base 445 slugging i think that would be a realistic kind of good outcome for bart it's not necessarily all-star production but if you're good defensively it's a very valuable package it's above league average offense because the average and the on base are average but the power is above average and then you're also providing value defensively so anyway coming up in just a minute we are going to talk about the farm system and how the dodgers keep churning out major league talent and trading guys away for superstars, and yet their farm system continues to rank ahead of the Giants. How is that possible? We'll get into it in just a second. But first, as you gear up for fall, and uh, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Simple tools like screening questions Make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB that is. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, as promised, more questions and answers. The first one coming from Richard, who says, How can the Dodgers farm system be moving up to third ranked and our Giants going down to 12th ranked when the Dodgers had no first round pick and only one pick in the top 100 this year in terms of the draft? Uh, and have traded away top prospects to get players in recent years. This is an this is the this is a great question because it is goes right to the heart of what may be the most significant issue for the Giants right now, and that is that their farm system has not. Here's the thing: it's always by external ranking sources. You know, like who different sources rank you different places. 
before the season, I think it was this year, baseball prospectus had the Giants at like number two in all of baseball. And some other sources had them more middle of the pack, like 15th or so. And I just saw, I think MLB Pipeline just ranked the Giants 18th right now in their updated midseason top 100 or top farm system rankings. And that's a serious problem. Like if they're actually eight, 18th, that's a problem because this, like Katie said with her question, your uh, whole philosophy has kind of been to tread water, try to stay somewhat competitive while you're continuing to develop. And we're four years into this new era and we haven't had any significant tr contributors. I guess that's not entirely true, right? Logan Webb, who wasn't considered a top prospect, this is what I'm talking about when I say these rankings don't necessarily mean anything because Logan Webb, who's kind of emerged as a, one of the better pitchers in Major League Baseball, wasn't considered a top prospect. And so, you know, if he's not a considered a top prospect, then you don't need to be considered a top prospect to be a good player. And a lot of guys who are considered really good prospects don't end up panning out. And so it all development is a huge part of this. And that's the thing, too, with Joey Bart. It's like he was considered a top prospect, but he struggled. And the development side of it is more important than anything. But anyway, I mean... You want to be clear and obviously just an elite farm system. You don't want to be like, oh, you've got to squint and think about it a certain way and kind of see the possibilities that we can develop better in order to view them as a good farm system. No, like you want to have a smack dab, obvious, great farm system. And the Giants haven't really been able to do that. And, you know, you've got guys like Marco Luciano who missed a couple months with a back injury. You've got Luis Matos taking a step back. Some intriguing, like Kyle Harrison has been great. Von Brown is super intriguing to me, and there's a question about him later. But yeah, it's a problem. And the simple answer that I have for you is not one that makes me happy or should make any Giants fan happy. And that is that the Dodgers are simply better at targeting talent and developing talent. And the Giants have work to do and it's disappointing given Farhan Zaidi comes over from the Dodgers you kind of figure that at least it's possible that they're going to get on that same level and so far it's taken longer and or it's just not going to happen than we could have hoped so yeah sorry to depress you there KM McConnell says please help me understand the team trotting out Yaz when he is so obviously struggling can he be helped with a reset like Bart, his ISO is down for the third consecutive year, and frankly, his power is what helped him provide a lot of his offensive value. Debo Samuel supporter rela relatedly says, does Yaz make the team next year? So yeah, Mike Yastrzemski's struggles are certainly nothing to joke about. Or, like it's, it's, uh, it's not a laughing matter. His decline is alarming, and I just have to say, like, when I read this question, it, it pops into my mind every my, every time I read it. But the isolated power going down, we have to keep in mind that the league average isolated power has gone down significantly. And so sometimes, like, a dip in ISO doesn't necessarily mean, or a dip in any number doesn't necessarily mean you're declining. It could mean that the league, in this case, I think it has a lot to do with the baseball this year is just simply different than it was the last few years. And I think the Giants kind of built their team around that old baseball and this new ball that doesn't fly as well has hurt them, I think. And it's hurt Mike Yastrzemski, but also, I mean, that's why a number like weighted runs created plus. It looks at it each year, it compares you to the overall league average. And I think that is a better way of doing it. But his that number has declined each of the last three years. It was 120 in his rookie season and then the short COVID year, 158 meaning 58 percentage points above league average offensively. Last year, just 105, which was a disappointment. And this year, just 95. So he's been a below average offensive contributor. I think that that matches the eye test, certainly. He's just been completely lost. He was hot to start the year, but he's just been cold ever since for a long stretch of time. So he still provided value as a base runner and as a defender. And the question, though, I sometimes get off topic, is that... You want to know why is he being trotted out there when he's so obviously struggling? The answer I have is that who is a better alternative? Because, 
you know, you might say a guy like Elliot Ramos, you might say a guy, I, I mean, David VR, just as an example, he doesn't play the same position. I don't know exactly who you're thinking of, but just to give an example of David VR, tearing it up in AAA, just the numbers are video game like comes to the major leagues, non-factor struggles. And so if you look at Mike Yastrzemski's minor league numbers, that's the thing. I just consistently see this kind of point being made. Like, why don't they give this guy a look? And the players they have in the major leagues, like Tommy LaStella and Mike Yastrzemski, who are struggling, are guys who would go down to AAA and given enough time would absolutely light up AAA. And so these are what they view as the best opportunity to make an impact. Certain guys, when you're talking about La Stella, for example, when you, you they're past their prime, and so you kind of figure, and then you've got your your immobility, the inability to kind of run the bases or play defense in La Stella's case. But they, I think that the reason is they think that it's the best option they have. And so that's, again, a function of the problematic farm system. They're not, if they, if they had like elite, prospects in the outfield tearing it up at the high levels of the minor leagues they would put them in there and possibly send Mike Yastrzemski down but they don't have that they've got a guy like Elliot Ramos sure but he's been bad in the minors and so you don't typically see a guy go from being bad in the minors to then being good in the majors it just doesn't usually work that way and so and again, like even a guy like Donovan Walton, right? There, he's taken a lot of heat this season, and I understand why. But we look at the guy they gave up to get him, and there's a lot of like seller's remorse or buyer's remorse. But Donovan Walton's numbers in the minors are great. And the guy who they gave up, Prelander Baroa, positive I'm not saying that name well, but he's tearing it up in the minors as well. But like, Walton, when he was at that level, did the same thing, tore it up. And so it's not apples to apples here. It's apples to oranges when you're comparing major league uh, production to minor league production. It's a different thing. And so that's why they just don't have upper minors prospects ready to go and replace him. He's the best option they think they have right now, which is a problem. And they probably need to be better either at just signing major leaguers who can be impact players or having a better farm system who can replace guys who are struggling. So yeah. Next question. Relatedly, Tommy LaStella, what are the chances he gets DFA'd? I know there's money tied up for next year, but we face three right-handed pitchers in consecutive days and he logged four at bats. This is also KM McConnell uh, who says it continues. If he isn't used when having the platoon advantage, why does he take up one of the four bench spots? And then GB Simus says, why is Isan Diaz not up over La Stella? I genuinely, genuinely don't understand what Farhan is doing with La Stella right now. So we're going to save this question for just a minute. What are the chances La Stella gets DFA'd and why are they using La Stella and not Isan Diaz? Yeah, in just a second. But first... All right, as promised, Isan Diaz, Tommy LaStella. It's a question that we have been asked all season long. I mean, Isan Diaz was brought in pretty early in the year. And my answer to this, this is actually a better example even than the one I was just giving with Mike Yastrzemski. I do believe, like, they, I don't know that this is the proper way to think about this, but the fact that Tommy LaStella is signed for next year for $11.5 million, they they feel like they do not want to give up on him. And also, rosters are expanding in about a week. And so I just don't see them like DFAing Tommy LaStella. I would never write it off as impossible. But if you just wait a week, you can add whoever, and he's you know you've got more bench pieces to work with. But the point I want to make about Isan Diaz so he's, he has 330 plate appearances with the Giants this year in AAA. And he's got a 132 weighted runs created plus there. Isan Diaz, formerly a pretty darn good prospect. And he was, I believe it was the Christian Yelich trade. He was a big part of it. And the thing is, he's logged 500 major league plate appearances, major league plate appearances with the Marlins. 
and he hit 185 with a 275 on base and 287 slugging. They despise Isan Diaz, to be frank, in Miami because he just was a huge bust. And 500 plate appearances is a pretty long look. Imagine like Donovan Walton having 500 plate appearances. That's basically what it was. A guy there was some expectation. I mean, different. Walton was never a top prospect, but there was big expectation with Diaz and he was considered a good prospect. And then he just did not perform. Wasn't a good defender. Didn't hit a lick, but always hit well in the minors. That's how you become a highly regarded prospect. And he's continuing to hit well in the minors. And so I just think this is another example of that. The idea that he's just going to be fixed is, I mean, I think they don't just look at what are your minor league numbers. They have more advanced data than we are looking at here. They're looking at bat path and and the speed with which you swing the bat and all kinds of different stuff that to them tells them it, whether or not you're going to have success. So the fact that we haven't seen Isan Diaz tells me they possibly, probably, perhaps don't believe that he would have any more success than La Stella or than he had when he was up with the Marlins. So I don't know. I guess the thing, the argument that that is valid is like, he can't be worse than La Stella. He could be. He has been in his major league career. A 54 weighted runs created plus. Even La Stella, as disappointing as he's been this year, has an 85 weighted runs created plus. So I hear the argument and I get it. Like the thing is he could be better, but he also could be no better and or worse. And then like to clear a spot, you're DFAing La Stella and then you're I don't know. I can see it both ways. I have at times lately in the last couple months, I've been a La Stella defender in the past, but lately I've just kind of turned and said, he probably just is what he is at this point, And it's probably not going to get much better. And you're only looking at one more year. And can they just continue to carry him? So eventually I wouldn't be shocked if he got DFA'd, but I think they're going to give him every possible opportunity. That just is the track record. And yeah, hopefully I answered that question thoroughly enough. Spencer says, why is Von Brown still in single A when he's tearing it up and 24 years old? So that is a good question. And they're, they've been slow to promote guys. That's kind of the simple answer I have for you. But I just want to take this opportunity to point out the ridiculousness of what Von Brown has been able to do simply in his entire Giants minor league career. So he was the only position player they took or he was the first position player they took in 2021 in the 10th round, 296 overall pick. This year, he, he has stolen 43 bases in the minors, and he has 23 home runs, and he's just doing ridiculous things. If you look at, so he started the year in low A, where he hit 346 with a 427 on base, 636 slugging, a 167 weighted runs created plus. Bonkers. He had 14 steals, excuse me, 14 homers, 23 steals in 59 games. He was then promoted to high A Eugene, where he has hit 360 with a 457 on base and 633 slugging, a 196 weighted runs created plus, almost 100% better almost two times better than the league average player in that league. And this is over 41 games where he has nine homers and 20 steals. And on the season, he's been caught six times, 43 steals, six caught stealings. The one thing I see when I look at the numbers is he's got an insane average on balls in play, which he has had his entire minor league career. So that's weird, but he's clearly like able to do it. I definitely think as the, level of competition gets tougher that's not going to last but at the same time he couldn't possibly be doing any better than he's done here in in low a and high a this season so the question why is he still in high a i don't entirely know i'd like to see them push him a little bit i mean he cannot possibly be doing any better than he's doing right now difference making kind of runner and i don't know his Development this year has been one of the bigger bright spots in the minor league system for the Giants, and I'm fascinated to watch his continued development. Something to watch over the last month and a half. Do they promote him for the last month? 
you know, if they do it, they'd probably do it pretty soon. And I think that his performance justifies it. The one thing too, the second thing is that the strikeout rate is kind of high. So maybe they have some concerns about that. It's 27%, but still these numbers are just bonkers and I'd like to see him get promoted. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen today. Now make your second listen the Locked on MLB podcast where MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast Locked on MLB on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thank you in advance, and thank you to everyone who's done so already. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have reaction to the Giants in Detroit. Carlos Rodon on the mound for the Giants. Also, a couple of moves. Uh, The Giants made an intriguing minor league signing. Could actually be a significant one. Former elite closer Ken Giles to the Giants on a minor league deal. So we'll get into that as well as reaction from the game. So I'll see you then. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.